And I'll tell you, the good news will be, when you see the problem, right within the problem, you'll identify the solution. What you see on the screen now is a cocaine addict's brain compared with a pornography addict's brain. Which one looks worse? Which one looks like it has more holes and areas of non-functionality? It's bewitching. It's a species of witchcraft from a Christian point of view because we know that the devil is the true one behind this. We form a new pathway. This becomes the new habit. Literally, the old brain, the old pathways, the old brain map, if you will, of roads is being replaced by a brand new one. This is what Paul is talking about in Romans 12, verse 2, when he says, we can have a renewed mind. And that's a promise. And I'm going to claim that for myself and for all my brethren, that God is going to give us that. If the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted to a behavior, then it's just as powerful to get you addicted to a new behavior. We can be enslaved to pure thoughts in this pornographized world that we live in today. I want to be impulsively obedient. I want to get to the point where I am just carrying out my own impulse in following God's will. And he sinks in humility at the foot of the cross, just where we need to be, right? But a voice speaks to him. From the oracles of God's word, in amazement, he hears the message. Hear this message. Ye are complete in him. Now all is at rest in his soul. Well, good morning and welcome back. The topic this morning is a tough one for many people and I wanna, wanna be clear on what the topic is so people can opt in or opt out. It's meant for uh, mature ages. So we, we, wanna, we wanna incorporate our children, our youth in this, but parents, this is a talk on the topic of lust and pornography addiction and very sensitive topics that we're going to be very straightforward and rather blunt on at times. Understanding the scientific background behind some of these things with a definite spiritual emphasis. So the, the session is entitled, Addicted to Purity in a Pornographic World. I should also mention that much of the good research and science and, and studies on this have been done as it relates to the male brain. So this is, a, to a great extent, about men. And I'm glad to see that some ladies are taking an interest in this as well because you can understand your male counterparts and understand how the actions of our culture might affect those in our community who happen to be men. So this is, by and large, from that perspective. But when it comes to overcoming addictions and habits of any kind, the principles that we will cover really apply across the board to any habits and any gender and any people in any age. So that's kind of an overview of where we're going. But I want to begin, most importantly, the place that we begin always, and that is with prayer. So would you bow your heads with me as we begin with prayer? Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the truth that you reveal in your word. And we understand that we're facing some difficulties on this human sexuality issue in this degenerate and hedonistic age. And we just ask for understanding, for wisdom and clarity. We ask for discernment and, and victory, most of all, over the lusts of the flesh that beset so many souls in this time in which we live. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin with some statistics. It's been said that only 13.9% of young adult males never view pornography. So that would mean 86.1% do view this material. 
13.9% do not. 50% of Christian men admit in surveys that they are flat out addicted to pornography. 54% of Christian pastors even admit that they have viewed pornography in the previous year. And when you look at Christian men in general, that number rises to 70% admit that they have viewed this stuff in the previous year. How about this one? One Canadian researcher attempted to launch a study on university age men, young men, and they wanted to find out uh, how the brain is changed by being exposed to this material, to pornographic images, videos, etc. So they wanted to find minds that had never seen it before, pure minds, and then spoil them and ruin them uh, by showing them this stuff and see how it affected their brain. Well, notice it says they attempted to launch a study on university age men. The study couldn't go forward, actually. Because they couldn't find any college-age males who weren't already using pornography. Isn't that sad? And so the conclusions of their findings, they came out with this statement, guys who do not watch pornography do not exist. Based upon the data set that we have available and the information that we've been able to ascertain from this study, or the lack thereof, we have to conclude that guys who do not watch pornography do not exist. Now, it's a little bit of an exaggeration, you understand. They're making a point. But I don't think the exaggeration is quite as intense as we might otherwise think. We've been warned about this, though. We've been warned that in the last days, men would become lovers of themselves, lovers of pleasure, and that we would live in a time where there is an addiction, a compulsive, habitual search and, and quest for the lusts of the flesh and the pleasures of this, of this human physiology. You know, there's a statement in the Review and Herald that says, just like in the time when Israel was about to cross over into the land of Canaan, the Jordan River was there. They, came to the, they were ready to cross and start into the promised land. And you know what? The devil didn't want that to happen, did he? He brought about Balaam to Balak to get Balaam to curse the Israelites. But Balaam, of course, blessed them three times. And so it didn't work. So what is the devil going to do in that situation where he can't, none of his other methods are working and he's got these, these enemies of his, the Israelites, ready to march into Canaan. He, he pulls out his ace of spades, so to speak. He pulls out the ultimate nuclear option. He sends in the Moabite women. Do you remember that story? Well, listen to this statement. The very same Satan is now working to weaken and destroy the people who are just on the borders of the heavenly Canaan. Satan knows it is his time. He has but little time left now in which to work, and he will work with tremendous power to ensnare the people of God upon their weak points of character. There will be women who will become tempters and who will do their best to attract and win the attention of men to themselves. Has this been fulfilled in our day or what? I mean, you look around and that's the world we see. We see the sexually alluring images through the advertisements, through the magazines, through the billboards, through the internet, everywhere you go, you can't even go to the grocery store and check out in the checkout lane without being assaulted with this imagery, the women attracting men to themselves, Satan pulling this nuclear option out in the last days to trip up the men from going into the promised land. And you know many of these men did not go in at the time of Israel. May that not be the case in these last days. We've been warned. We know the trick, we know the danger, we know the attack, and we have a battle plan to counter that attack. Now, I want to give you one last statistic, because we, we, we rifled through some pretty alarming statistics, like, what, 70% of men in the church admit that in the previous year they have been viewing this material? This is horrific, this is terrible. Half of them say they're addicted. But there is a statistic that has not yet been compiled, to my knowledge. I hope that it's soon compiled because I will add it to this presentation and it will bring us much hope. But I believe the statistics out there, even though I don't know the numbers yet, but based upon what I have ascertained and discerned from watching the developments in the church today and in American society in general, I believe that there are more men today finding victory over and freedom from these captivating addictions than at any time in history. Because we had such a large percentage and probably still have such a large percentage of our people struggling with these lusts that, that over time you, you get such a large bulk starting to throw up their hands and saying, what must we do to be saved? We will do anything. Let's study this. Let's understand this from God's perspective. And what might he call us to do? And more people getting serious about it, taking on this issue in their lives. Which leads to the question that many men have asked. Why is it so hard to stop? 
Many people have gone, ah, you know, for many years, you know, I've just been in this, this cycle of addiction. Why can't I break free from this? Why can't I kick this thing? Well, it says in Mind, Character, and Personalities that moral principle is exceedingly weak when it conflicts with established habit. So moral principle, we all know it's wrong. Everybody, they don't want to do it, right? It's like in your heart of hearts and your motives and your desire to be like Christ, you want to break free from it. You have the moral principle of feeling, feeling sinful when you've done wrong. But moral principle is weak when it's confronted with established habit. This is another way of saying addiction, a pathway in the brain that's been laid down that is so wide that it becomes so habitual you compulsively travel down that thought pattern, that behavior, without even thinking about it. And after the fact you go, ah, oh, what have I done? Now I want to show you some brain scans of how the human brain is changed when somebody goes from being a normal brain to a lust addict brain. This is a normal human brain under a SPECT scan, single photon emission computerized tomography scan. That's a good looking brain right there, isn't it? A lot of activity, a lot of good contours there. And this is from the top of the brain. And the, the bottom of the picture is the front. The top of the picture is the back of the brain, okay? Now I'm going to show you a pornography addict's brain. Do you see the difference there? Notice the holes in the areas of non-functionality happening there in the pornography addict's brain, particularly in the prefrontal cortex, right up there at the front, in the very bottom of the picture. Just so happens to be the place where the Bible says the seal of God is placed in the forehead. That frontal region, very little activity, not even showing up under the spec scan. So what has happened here? Something very serious. A change in the brain. Take a look at this one. This is a cocaine addict's brain from the bottom now. This is an image from the bottom. And there's a lot of areas of, of, of non-functioning as we just saw from the top in the pornography addict's brain. But compare the cocaine addict's brain image from the spec scan versus the pornography addict. The pornography addict's brain looks just a bit worse, doesn't it? I mean, there's more areas, holes of non-functioning. And I'm thinking at this point, Wow. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I grew up in the 1980s when on the television they had those commercials where they would scare the kids out of doing, you know, narcotics and illicit drugs. And it was a good thing because they would take that, that pot, that pan with the, the hot oil or butter or whatever in there and they would take an egg and they would go, this is your brain this is your brain on drugs, kids, right? You don't want to do drugs. And it was like, what? And, and I remember hearing chapel message and assemblies at, at the schools I went to, and it would be like, guys, come and tell them their story of how they come out of this drug addiction scene and how terrible it was and how captivating and how it ruined their minds and ruined their lives, and they found freedom. We need those same kinds of messages about this issue here. And for that matter, if I might slip into media on the brain mode, uh, video game addiction and other things that, that we're just captivated by. I mean, there are 19 million video game addicts in our culture today. And this thing is just, just capturing a large swath of the male population. It is a major problem. And you saw in the brain scan, maybe a bigger deal than drugs in terms of the effect upon the brain and our ability to have what the Bible would be called a renewed mind, a transformed brain. Now, we're going to have a lot of good news, too, okay? We're kind of diagnosing the problem here. But you're going to see the renewed brain at the end of this message, okay? Because everything that we do to our brains to wire it in, a, in the wrong direction, it can be recovered. So I just want to give you that little hint of what's coming so that we don't go, oh, no, we've been ruined, we're lost forever. No, not at all. But we've done some serious damage. And we've got to come to terms with that in order to take this thing as seriously as it deserves. Listen to this statement from Dr. Jeffrey Satinover. He says, Modern science allows us to understand that the underlying nature of an addiction to pornography is chemically nearly identical to a heroin addiction. Dr. Judith Reisman said something similar. She said, pornography triggers a myriad of endogenous, internal, natural drugs that mimic the high from a street drug. Addiction to pornography is addiction to what I dub erototoxins. Mind-altering drugs produced by the viewer's own brain. So you might think, well, I'm, I'm not a drug user. I'd never use drugs. I mean, what a terrible thing. What a way to ruin your life and become, you know, one of these, these people that are just, you know, drug addicts. And you just have this, this perception, this stereotype of, of how horrible that is. And it's a correct perception to a great extent because you don't want to go there. And we would never do that. But many of us find ourselves in a situation where we are doing that. But the drugs are internally released. At just like a heroin addiction, mind-altering drugs produced by the viewer's own brain, the viewer of pornography. Now, I know that the way that these guys look, just kind of some stock photos of men looking depressed, uh, is the feeling 
that really starts to take over the heart and mind and, and emotions of many men who are in this, this just vicious cycle of addiction, isolation, shame and remorse and just, just, just toxic emotions of the accuser coming in and just beating down the user of pornography, the addict to anything for that matter, feeling they, 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 they can't get out of this. And you know I called the devil the accuser? That's what the Bible says, the accuser of our brethren. He comes around to get God's people or any people into a state of just feeling condemnation and just the weight of not, not momentary appropriate guilt. That, that's a good thing. God gives us that sensation of guilt, that feeling within the, the brain. It's, it's, a, it's an actual reaction in the brain where if you've done something wrong, it's kind of like you touch a hot stove and, and, and your, your, your neurons, in your, your, the nerves in your finger rather, say, ouch, don't do that, right? It's a red flag saying, this is harmful, do not do that. Well, in the anterior cingulate cortex of the brain, you get that actual same feeling of, oh man, I've done something wrong. It's called guilt, right? And that's appropriate, but only as a momentary thing, as an alert, as a, a, a poke in the eye wake up call that uh, you need to make things right by confession, by repentance, by, by, by doing something differently now. But when the devil can get us in that state in a chronic way where we have just a chronic feeling of guilt and shame and remorse and condemnation from God and like those guys look, right? And just depression sets in. And that's the accuser's goal because, well, he's a brilliant, brilliant, evil genius. Because if he can get that to happen, number one, he's got us feeling just horrible and not gaining any victory and finding any forgiveness. Number two, also, we're cut off from God because we're like, oh, I can never turn to him. I mean, I'm not worthy. I just feel like a rotten scoundrel and I just, I just, uh, I've failed him too many times. And this is the cycle that many people enter into, which we're going to, we're going to correct in just a moment. But a third thing that the devil's doing here is, take a look at this. There is, when you're ruminating over your failures, you're actually passing the mind over the exact same pathways in neurological circuitry as the behavior itself. And so you're reinforcing that behavior. So when you think through those same thought patterns, you're widening those areas in the brain. And so you're increasing the likelihood of engaging in that sin again when we're just beating ourselves up over it and flog flogging ourselves over it. So what God wants to do is separate our sin from us as far as the east is from the west. When he says, I forgive you and remember your sins no more, he's saying, I'm going to take your sins and throw them in the depths of the sea. They're gone. This is not something we think through and rehearse and go, oh, I'm so terrible like this. No. I mean, yes, we're all born in sin, conceived in iniquity. We acknowledge our sin. We, we accept that appropriate guilt that the God says, those whom I love, I rebuke and chasten. So there's a difference between appropriate guilt and just chronic shame and constant guilt. The appropriate guilt gets us out of it. That's the goal, is to get us out of that state of sin instead of pushing us down and keeping us in it. You see the psychological dynamic that the devil has men on a downward spiral on, and it's very, very tragic and sad. But we've got the good news. The gospel, the everlasting gospel of Jesus Christ. He came and took that sin. Everything that we're beating ourselves up for, he's taken that beating. And when we think we need to put it on ourselves, well, we're, we're, we're taking away from him the privilege of taking our sin from us that he already took to the cross. Then it's double punishment. Well, well, how silly is that? That's unnecessary. Let it go. Allow God to forgive again. And I know all of us were like, oh, but I failed him so many times. How could he forgive me again? Because he is love and he is infinite in his mercy. And there's nothing that can, that can cut that off. I mean, have you ever read that parable of the prodigal son? It's an amazing parable if you really think about the culture that Jesus spoke that in. When the, when the son came to the father and said, uh, I want my inheritance now, I'm leaving. That was something that absolutely would never, ever be done. done. Uh, that was like the greatest social more violation in history. I mean, it just, just it never would happen. Although, actually, historians and people, the scholars tell us there have been a couple occasions in history where they've found that this took place. And you're talking to people from ancient Near Eastern cultures, etc. And the, the occasion where this happened, one time the father heard his son say that to him and he just died on the spot, whether heart attack or who knows what. But he was just so overwhelmed with the thought, he just, he, he, he died. In another occasion, the, um, the brothers of the young man heard that he had done this to their father and totally disrespected him in a culture of honor and respect. And they went out and hired a hit team and they hunted the kid down and killed him. 
So, whoa, this is kind of serious. This is not just like you were a little bit rude, young man. No, the listeners to this story are going, what did he say to his father? That is so unbelievably unacceptable. That is so beyond the pale. This is unthinkable. I mean, Jesus is really <laughs> bringing up some, uh, some, some very vivid imagery with a young man coming saying, I want my inheritance, I'm leaving now. Now, the young man makes it worse, by the way. He goes off and he begins to waste away all the money and spends it on prostitutes, appropriate for our talk here today, right? And he's hanging out with the pigs. This is the most just degraded low thing you can imagine. He wants to eat the pig food. Oh, who, what's going to happen to this kid? The listeners are hearing this story going, somebody's got to go out and get, I mean, somebody's going to teach this kid a lesson, right? I mean, somebody's got to squash him. He is so unworthy. And then he says to himself, he's going to return to his father? Uh, I don't think so, young man. I mean, they're just red-faced listening to this going, Ugh! but you know what? That's not how God is. What is the father doing? The father is looking this direction toward his son, waiting for him to come back. And the son's got his own ideas about how he needs to confess and repent and all that appropriate stuff that we need to do. But from the father's perspective, all of that confession and repentance is not making him more loving toward his son. He's already directed this way and he sees his son coming and he runs and he hugs him. And that's his attitude toward his son before his son ever repents. While we were still what? Sinners. Christ died for us. That's the extravagant love of God that we can never forget. If we don't picture God in this way and we start viewing him as some, some harsh, exacting creditor, somebody who's off in an aloof, distant stance like this, well, yeah, you're going to have to make it up to me someday. No, that's not his attitude at all. So if we get this idea from the accuser, who's not only accusing us, but he's accusing God of being this dictatorial figure, and that's not to take away justice. I mean, there is absolute justice in the universe as well. But that doesn't take one ounce away from God's love, which is never ending, which is the central meaning of his character. God is love, the very definition of God. Do not forget that. Now, I want to talk about that love of God, because when you think about this issue of relational intimacy, and you go all the way back to the Garden of Eden, when God created mankind, this was a, it says man and, man and woman were created in his, in his what? In his image. So what is God like? Well, we've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the Spirit of God was over the waters. And God said, said, what is God's word? What is the word? Who is the word? Become flesh. Jesus. When God speaks, this is Jesus speaking the world into existence. So you already see a threeness within the nature and character of the Godhead. God at his very core nature, Father, God the Son, God the Spirit, the three are in a relational setting. I mean, this is very different from most religions out there, which, you know, maybe they, they have an animistic God or a, a you know, a, a, a pantheistic God or, or a, a solitary God where there's no, there's no Son, there's no, there's no plurality to a Godhead, but it's just a singularity, a solitary being who all by himself in the universe, before the creation of angels, before the creation of man, all by himself, could not truly be a God of love because there's no one to be giving to and sacrificing for and loving and having that connection and relationship with. But we've got the Godhead. We've got a three-person situation here. The Father, the Son, the Spirit. So God is love. And love is a relational word. It's a self-sacrifice. It's a principle of self-sacrificing love. Love is a principle of beneficence, of giving, and a relational principle. And that's what God is like. And then mankind is made in his what? Image, male and female. A plurality that become one. Oh, is this sounding kind of familiar with who God is and how he made us? So when we think about the issue of, of intimacy in general. We were created to reflect that image of God and to have relational connection ourselves. And it was Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, but it's not only that. There are many human relationships that we can engage in where we have deep intimate bonds and connections. Father and son, mother and son, father and daughter, mother and daughter, sister and brother, the family of God, the people of God, close deep friends that we, that we find and we bond and connect with at a very spiritual and deep level. This is called intimacy, broadly speaking. Now there is 
the intimacy of marriage, and there is sexual intimacy within marriage, but the broader concept of intimacy just means relational connectedness in general. And it's a wonderful, wonderful gift from God. And I know that many men have confused, or many people have confused this issue of intimacy with sexuality, and they, they make the two synonymous. And men will say, well, I have needs, you know, I have needs. I have to be acting out sexually or being gratified sexually in, in, any, in some sort of manner. And as I thought about that, I, I, physiologically, biologically, psychologically, you, you can't identify sexuality as a need. Sexual pleasure is not a need. You won't die without it, right? I mean, Jesus Christ lived 33 years of pure abstinence and thrived, right? And so, yes, you need water, you need food, or you will die. Uh, but, you know, the, the evolutionary psychologists get this wrong because they look at the area of the brain where we have the drive centers for food and water, and it's the same area as the drive center for sexual desires. And they go, well, then sex is a human need. Well, no, because you won't die if you don't have that, right? But um, there is an actual need here. We're talking about intimacy right now, right? And so many people say, well, I have needs. I have to have these, these experiences or I'm not like, you know, fully human or I'm not, you know, experiencing life and, uh, and I just won't thrive if I don't have sexual experiences. Not true. But you won't thrive if you don't have intimacy. And I mean some type of human intimacy, friendship, family connections, and most of all, our connection with God, the deepest relationship how deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure He has lavished upon us. And we return and call Him Father, Abba, and Jesus, our Savior, and friend of sinners, and brother. I mean, do you hear the family words here? This deep, intimate connection is a need, but human sexuality is just one expression of one relationship that is especially intimate, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful gift from God. I don't mean to demean it. But for those of us who are not finding that in the present situation we find ourselves in in life or whatever, don't idolize that as the end-all and be-all of all humanity, okay? This is just one expression, a part of hum, human, human experience, but God has fulfilled. How about this verse? It says, you have satisfied, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. And we say, well, 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 I have sexual desires and God's not satisfying those. No, he's given us the desire for intimacy and he's satisfying that in many different facets in human life and relationships. You follow me, right? So why did God make me this may, way? Many men struggling with this. They go, oh, why did God make me this way? I'm struggling with this. I, I don't want this in my life anymore. Well, if you think about this in the context of God's nature, how he created us, and then this marital intimacy of which sexuality is a component, this is all reflecting God's character, right? Be Ephesians 5 says marriage, the husband and the wife, is like Christ and the church. And so we're, we're, we're communicating an idea, we're communicating a picture for all to see about what God is like when we have happy, loving homes and marriages. And so God has given us this in order to help us to not know just each other more, but to know Him and to communicate Him more to others. 1 Corinthians 6 talks about when, when somebody unites themselves sexually, it, they are becoming one, one flesh. But then it flips that and it says, and we are to become one spirit with God. So you see, this is a picture of, this is an analogy for the bigger, deeper spiritual meanings that are even more amazingly intimate and wonderful in terms of our spiritual friendship with our Father in heaven. But really to answer this question, why did God make me this way? Um, he didn't. And what do you mean, Scott? He didn't make us this way. He didn't make us this way. The way that we live today in the 21st century and the way that we are today let me go specifically. We are super sexually preoccupied in our society today. This isn't how we were in the beginning. God made, made male and female in his own special design for the perfect unity and the perfect balance. But then the fall happened, right? The fall happened, the fall of mankind into sin. And now human beings have become a selfish species and, 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 and they perpetuate and have children and pass on DNA and epigenetically the changes of sin are now in the human race. And we have become a selfish people. So preoccupied with my pleasures, etc. right? How about this one? 6,000 years later, there has been the moral and physical degradation of the human race. So did God make us this way or did he make Adam and Eve the perfect way, right? He, he's not responsible for this. This is Satan's temptation, Adam and Eve's choice, and all of our subsequent choices to degrade the human race, to get us in this state of being so over-sexualized, so over-stimulated with these things. 
Now there's two more reasons why we are so sexually preoccupied. We have a currently a hypersexualized 21st century culture and many of us have accepted that culture and inculcated the habits of mind that it has brought to us. Now I have little asterisks by numbers three and four. You wanna know why? Well the first two, the fall and the last 6,000 years, we can't do anything about that. We are where we are in history right now. We can be redeemed from what has failed, fallen and gone before us, but we can't change the history. But the things that are going on right now, we can change. We can not expose ourselves to the hypersexualized 21st century culture. We can not watch all of the worldly media and the things that are being put out there, right? And we can make sure that we don't accept the distorted ideas about sexuality that are being funneled through the advertising industry and the mainstream media and all of this. So take media on the brain, just cut and paste it right there because there's a lot more to be said about that, but not, not, no time right now. But, you know, that's why we are the way we are today. So we can't blame God for that. We're so sexually preoccupied because of these four reasons, two of which we can do something about, and God has given us the victory to redeem everything that went before us. That is wonderful. So why did God give us a sexual nature? Let me, let me pan out and get a bigger picture here, okay? We've got God's nature. We've got the creation of Adam and Eve here. We've got the, one, the oneness here to reflect the oneness there. But all of this is happening in the context of some wider, bigger story. You've heard of the great controversy, right? It's Lucifer in heaven, a holy angel at one time invented a new concept, the concept of rebellion, sin, lawlessness. Really at its core, it was self-centeredness, selfishness, self-promotion. And that was called the, the entrance of evil into the, into the universe. And when Lucifer did that, you know what he was doing? He was making accusations against the father. He's the father of lies, right? Satan is the father of lies. So he goes to the, the, the other angels in heaven and he's, he, he starts making lies and accusations about God in heaven. Well, God's character is what? Again, God is love. And so Satan's making these accusations, tearing down God's character, saying he's not who he says he is. No, you need to put me on the throne and I'm going to be way better. So we now live in this phase in the history of the universe, this period where these accusations have been made and now God is vindicating his character. He's proving himself to the onlooking universe. And our lives, let me, let me just show you what the Bible says. The Bible says we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. And then it also says the gospel contains things which angels desire to look into. So the onlooking universe is looking at the cross and our lives and what, what's happening here on this earth, and they're learning some things. And mankind is learning some things. And so our families, our homes, our marriages, our lives in general, not only reflect God's character in some beautiful way to just, to just bring glory to God, but also to answer the charges and the accusations that have been made and to disprove them. Because when we live selflessly and we understand what it means to be one flesh, it means to give oneself for the other. This whole intimacy and sexuality thing is nothing selfish. It's, it's one of giving oneself to another. And that picture of a happy home, of, of spouses that sacrifice one for the other, or just human beings if you're not married, living for the benefit of those around you. This is powerful evidence in the great controversy that convinces minds, heavenly and of this earth, of the truth of God's character and of the falsity of Satan's claims and charges. Well, thanks for tuning in to this seminar video. I can say confidently that God is changing many, many lives through the information that you've seen in this video. We hear it from folks all the time in the feedback we get. And we operate on a shoestring budget. Literally, it's by God's grace through folks like yourself ordering the full DVD seminars. Go to beltoftruthministries.org. This is what funds us and enables us to share more material like this. You'll see there the Greater Lust full six DVD set. We've got a whole host of other topics there at beltoftruthministries.org, from the media and entertainment to the parenting to true education and the lust topic. I want to thank you in advance for ordering DVDs, for sharing them. That's what it's all about, is changing lives. So may the Lord richly bless your family with more of His Spirit and more of Jesus. Thanks for watching. That is kind of a big picture of this whole thing. You might have been like, well, well you know, why did God give us this, this sexual nature? And, and why did he, well, yeah, procreation. I mean, we get that, be fruitful and multiply. But there's so many bigger spiritual things happening about God's actual nature and character. And that in the context of this great controversy. So that gets me kind of motivated here to think more deeply about this. So now let's just, let's, let's uh, zoom right in to the little micro aspect of this, the human brain. You ready to see? the lust cascade. You want to understand 
how the devil has really gotten the brains of God's people in these last days in this addictive cycle. We're going to do a science lesson now, okay? We just, we just, just switched from like big picture, massive theological concepts, and now we're going to be looking at the science. And you know why? Because these are all the same thing. The hypothalamus. This area is hardwired, not very what they call plastic, not very malleable or changeable. This is the area of the, of the brain where you have your, your, your desires and passions for food, water, for sexual desires, okay? This area of the brain is not going anywhere. It's not changing, okay? This isn't something we like want to gain victory over, the, the desire for water. No, that, that's part of our embedded in our human nature, okay? Now, when we start being preoccupied about these things, it starts with this area of the brain called the LGN. So step one, the first stop of that, that sexual image on the billboard or on the magazine or on the screen, what's happening in your brain when it's becoming alerted to this? Well, in the thalamus of the brain is this place called the LGN. This is also hardwired. It's not, not plastic, not changeable, and it automatically sends the image to the occipital lobe here in the back of the head to be processed and considered and evaluated and analyzed. Now, this is where we can make a choice. Like noticing something that is attractive to us, that immediate just millisecond, that happens automatically. That's hardwired into us. But when we begin to ponder it and contemplate it and think about it, that's the occipital lobe visually taking in these images. This is where we have a lot of uh, control and choice, and we'll get back to that in a minute. But as you're, as you're going down the lust cascade, that's really what's causing what's, what's referred to as this this getting on a highway process. The, the neurological pathways in the brain are described as like a highway, where you're getting on an on-ramp, and there are high containment walls, and there are very few exits, and you're going down this habitual wide path in the brain where the physiological process is engaged. The heartbeat is increasing now to 100 beats per minute. You are lusting at this point. And at this point, your prefrontal cortex shuts down. Your, 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 your executive centers of self-control are just very little activity happening at all. Cortisol and norepinephrine are released, and you are that means you're in survival mode, basically. You're in reactive mode. You're in fight or flight, you're in, you're in pleasure seeking mode. Now, you see the brake pedal there on the screen? That's the prefrontal cortex. We do not want the prefrontal cortex to be disengaged because that's where we go, nope, we're not going down that road again. We've been down there, that's called sin, that's called sadness, that's called lust, that's called going places I don't ever want to go again. So you want that brake pedal engaged. So everything that we can do to increase the strength of our, the, the frontal circuits of our brain is going to improve our victory plan as we talk about that in the, in the next few minutes. But that's the lust cascade. As people are going down this, you hit step three. You've beheld that image or that thought for more than just that millisecond. You're, 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 you're contemplating it, and you're, the hypothalamus drive tension is increasing, and that is causing, this is all kind of happening really at the same time. The heartbeat is increasing to 100 beats per minute. Prefrontal cortex is shutting down as the amygdala is becoming agitated. As you beheld that image or thought for more than that millisecond, the drive tension of the hypothalamus increases, and this causes amygdala agitation. Step five, typically for most people, is eventually you'll get to the step of sexual activity of an immoral nature in most cases. And with enormous quantities of dopamine and endogenous opiates being released, and the pleasure reward circuits and centers of the nucleus accumbens and the cingulate cortex are stimulated, so the brain feels pleasure just as the same with just the same as with substance abuse. So it's just like a drug. This is the internal natural drugs that mimic the high from a street drug and like a, like a heroin addiction. And then after sexual release, the amygdala immediately is calmed. Anxiety and tension is released. Now we call this the lust cascade. Where this, is, this is all in the scenario of an inappropriate extramarital lust where something that is not within God's design has uh, made, availed itself to the eyes and the lusts are attracted and you're going down this pathway and it's... Sin, right? This is where you, where you don't want to go. This is the pathway many people have gone. And that leads to step six, because at step six, you've got this chemical called norepinephrine. And that within the brain burns the initial arouser, that image, that place, that trigger, that association, is burned into your memory. So your memory, your brain, it's called the salience network. It's within the limbic system of the brain. Salience means like things that are significant or meaningful to the brain. And the brain goes, ooh, that was immensely pleasurable. I want to call that up and at another time because that was meaningful to, to our experience of the brain seeking pleasure. Now, that's the lust cascade, but there are results of this. What are the consequences of this? Because this doesn't just happen in a vacuum with no, no consequences. So the effects of the lust cascade are, first of all, 
When you activated that amygdala, the amygdala is the fear and anxiety center within the brain, within the limbic system. That's being activated. That's really the, the feeling of lust is that the amygdala agitating. The amygdala is asking for sexual activity, and then when that takes place, that's when it's calmed, okay? But since it was agitating and agitating and being exercised, well, what happens is the amygdala is now more predominant within the brain. Fear and anxiety and lust circuitry is being widened and, and, and enhanced. At the same time as the anterior cingulate cortex is being impaired. These two are kind of like a teeter-totter is the analogy. When one is engaged, the other is disengaged. When the one is engaged, the other is disengaged. So when the anterior cingulate cortex, which is your conscience, your thoughts of altruism, you know, a lot of the spiritual things of the frontal lobe, when that is, is engaged, the amygdala is, is calmed. When the amygdala is firing off and agitating and, and fear and lust and all these things, well, then thoughts of love for others and altruistic deeds and empathetic thoughts about the needs of others, those are turned off. So this is not a good place to be going, right? I mean, if we're exercising that way, we're enhancing those selfish nature, uh, that selfish nature over against the spiritual nature. So over time, we're going to be weakening our character very much. Then secondly, another effect of this is we've, we've targeted the pleasure receptors of the brain directly. Instead of God's normal methods for seeking pleasure, where, where we pursue life God's way and we do things God's way and, and the frontal lobe fills with activity and then that naturally makes us feel good and, and we feel happy and joy and pleasure in life. Well, we've, we've decoupled that whole, you know, uh, unified, holistic experience that God has put in here. And we've kind of just like pff, amputated that. We've lobotomized ourselves by, pew, we just go right for the, the, the pleasure centers directly. And now we don't have that normal route to prep pleasure and we become addicted to the hedonistic drug-like results of, of an addiction. The higher cortex, the third effect of this is that the higher cortex is left out of the equation again, the higher nature, the frontal lobe. And you know what? When you leave that out of the equation, you become more impulsive, you have less self-control, and you have more self-centeredness. The fourth effect of the lust cascade is life becomes less enjoyable. Uh, the, the brain on the left there is a healthy control brain with all of the pleasure centers lit up and people just having fun and happiness and joy in, in, in Jesus and in reading the Bible and being a family and being in nature. Just, just normal life is enjoyable. The drug abuser there, and that drug, whether that's cocaine or heroin or video games or pornography, you just have less joy and pleasure in life because everything else is lame compared to the thing that you love to do and you need to do in order to get that pleasure hit. So, you know, you need more of it. It's just the, the proverbial, uh, you know, drug abuse cycle where, where the same dose doesn't bring about the same result. You have to increase the dose and increase the experience, and that's why people end up in really dark places within this pornographic addiction. The fifth effect of the lust cascade is, and this is from mind, character, and personality, the sensitive nerves of the brain have lost their, their healthy tone by morbid excitation to gratify an unnatural desire for sensual indulgence. What is that saying? Well, basically all the holiness pathways of a renewed mind and a spiritual brain are starting to lose their healthy tone. Those nerves are literally becoming smaller, weaker, and less, less likely to be used. And where all of the pleasure centers are just clamoring for more pleasure. The sixth effect of the lust cascade have to do with these chemicals called oxytocin and vasopressin. These are the trust hormones or the love hormones, the bonding hormones, and they are released in large quantities in response to sexual encounter. And you've probably heard this is common when a woman gives birth to a baby, a lot of oxytocin, vasopressin through breastfeeding and through, through sexual encounter as well. These are human bonding and love hormones, right? And it's a wonderful thing God has given to us. It's, it's meant to drive us into that deeper relationship with, with, our, with our family, with our spouse especially in this context that we're talking about with the sexuality. But the reality here is that um, when people are engaged in this with strangers online, with images and videos of, of, of people online, there's actually a bond, a release that's being taken place there with that fictitious fantasy scenario, or even if it's just in your mind or whatever, and that's not real, right? And what it's doing is it's, it's 
countering and conflicting with that real bond. You know, this stuff destroys marriages. I'm sure you've heard that and known that. I mean, the marriage relationships just, become, just weakens and weakens and becomes less intimate, less close, less joyful, less sexuality happening in an appropriate way because it's all being redirected over into this degraded uh, immorality and these, these bonds that are being created with, with hundreds of, of women all over the Internet. I mean, what, is, what a strange thing the Internet has brought us in this, in this age of, 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 of lack of true love. You know, the Bible says the love of most will grow cold because there's a counterfeit love happening here. In fact, there was a um, situation many years ago when the, uh, the, 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 on, in the East Coast of the United States, they wanted to create a silk industry, okay? And so they got all these silk moths, and these, and these, um, these, these what, do they, what do you call them? I'm glad I got a picture there. What kind of moth is it? Gypsy moth. They've got all these gyps, gypsy moths that they released into the environment to try to create the sil silk industry, but they got loose, and they started eating up all the foliage of the trees, and they were ruining the vegetation. And the people were going, oh, no, what do we do to annihilate the, the, the gypsy moths here? And so they tried sprays and chemicals and different things, and nothing was working. They weren't getting a handle on the preponderance of these, the, of these moths. And so what they decided to do was something very, very brilliant. They took the, the scent of the female gypsy moth, and they encapsulated it in, in capsule form in, in super strength and intensity. And then they released that in the environment of the gypsy moths. So then when it came to mating season, and the male gypsy moths come out and they're like, whoa, this is crazy. And they're, they're obsessing over these capsules. They're just flocking to these capsules. And the female gypsy moths are over here going like, what's going on here? Well, there's a counterfeit intimacy happening here. And it's not real, but the male gypsy moths just can't help but be all over there. You see, that's what the devil's doing here. He's created a counterfeit where that, that pornographic image, that sexually alluring image, advertises itself to the brain as this is the drive to intimacy that you've been created for. But we have to use our thinking cortex and say, uh, no, this is not within the bonds of a marital relationship, of a commitment, of self-sacrifice. This is a quick fix to the pleasure centers that's going to lead down a cycle of addiction and no true intimacy over here. I mean, the moths weren't able to think that, but we're human beings, right? We're not animals. We can think through these things. And by God's grace, we will. Have you ever been really, really hungry? and gone on a road trip, and you're driving down the road, and it's been forever since you've eaten, and you, you, you stop by a gas station, okay? Now, I know many of you have had this situation, so we'll all be honest with one another here, where you start looking at some of that food on the, the counters, uh, on the shelves of the gas station, and you're like, that looks, that looks good, right? Because you're, you're starving, you haven't eaten, and you're like, oh, you know, some of this isn't quite as bad as some, uh, some of the other stuff on here. And, oh, but then the Twinkie reveals itself to you in all of its glorious sugariness. And you remember eating that Twinkie when you were a kid or whatever. And you're like, oh, man, it's been a long time uh, since I've... And, and, and you're, just, you're just clamoring for that Twinkie. And, and, you, and you, just, you just gobble that Twinkie up, okay? Now, um, you thought that that Twinkie was food, didn't you? Your, your brain was like, that, that's good food. That's really good food. You really, really want that. It's going to really satisfy you. Eat that food, eat that food, eat that food. Is the Twinkie food? I want you to think about the definition of food for a moment. I'm thinking about doing a series called Counterfeit Food. Exposing, just what, this is not food, right? Uh, counterfeit food. It, it's, it, it advertises itself as food, but it's really not food, is it? It's, it, it tastes amazing. It, it's like you're eating some incredible food. And the, the taste buds think it's food and it goes to the digestive system and the body's like, oh, what is this? And it's like kind of messing with you a little bit and it partially digests and, and, and the body goes, oh, what just happened there? And the brain was like, ooh, that was really tasty. And so you're all into this confused setting. But, but you thought it was food. And the brain's like, salience network, remember that? That tasted really good. Go there again next time. But it's all a counterfeit, isn't it? It's not food. Now, let's switch the analogy. You go to that same gas station, and you're going down the road, and you have just stopped at your favorite salad bar buffet, okay? You've had a good, nutritious meal. Maybe you found a good, a good restaurant with some whole food, plant-based items, and you're like, man, I am just, I'm full, I'm satisfied. Then you need to stop by the gas station to, you know, make a pit stop, and you walk into the convenience store of that, and, and the Twinkie reveals itself to you, and it's like, come over here. You're gonna wanna take a bite. Is it a little easier to resist the Twinkie when you're, man, I, I just had a really good meal, right? It's a little bit easier. So let's think about this as it relates to intimacy. 
if that pornographic image and that sexually alluring image that shows up on the magazines and wherever on the internet, if it's really actually a counterfeit, advertising itself as a draw to intimacy, not that you're thinking that logically, but, but the brain is designed to be drawn to that for that purpose, for intimacy reasons, to, in God's universe, you know, do all of this good stuff. But this is not good stuff. The brain has to go, no, 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 this is not right. But you know what makes it a lot easier to say no to that? If we've had a good meal of the true, meaningful intimacies that God has given to us, family, friendship, our relationship with Christ, time in the Word, walking in the woods, singing and talking with our Savior who walks with me and talks with me along life's narrow way, walking with God as Enoch walked, having deep relationships within the church body, restoring relationships that have struggled in the past with family or with friends, finding deep connection. You know what that does? It fills us up. And then when this, and and it might sound like, Scott, I'm not, I don't really get that. Like, well, how does that work? I don't know how it works. It's an amazing spiritual thing. But when we are connected to God and to others, this doesn't have as much allurement to us and pull on us. Now, you might say, well, then, then we can all be, have, be victorious over this just, just by, just by have, having good friends. No, there are other steps in this, too. But this is one of the really big steps. And what they've found in research is that um, young men, men who come from emotionally disengaged homes as children, in other words, as children, there, there wasn't much connection. There wasn't much joy. There wasn't much friendship in the home. It was kind of just isolated and disconnected and emotionally just not there, right? Or, or maybe, maybe there was a lot of negativity and criticism. Those men are far more likely to become pornography addicts than men who come from homes where there was a lot of warmth and love and joy in the Lord Jesus. Isn't that an interesting statistic? It's like when we're filled up, it's a lot easier to say no. Same thing with the Twinkie, same, th- same thing here with the lust. Now, to switch the subject slightly, I have personally witnessed Christian school teachers, I said Christian school teachers, telling their middle schoolers, children, today we are going to talk about masturbation in class, and I'm going to tell you that this behavior is acceptable and good as a Christian, and you should feel comfortable continuing in this behavior if you are doing so. And those who are not doing so, you may start at some point, and I want you to feel appropriate about that. Now, um, I want to show you some of what the research and the scientists are saying. Also, some, we have some Spirit of Prophecy Council on this that absolutely needs to make a comeback. But you'll see, this one right now I'm going to show you is from a psychologist who happens to be just an evangelical Christian out there. Okay, He's not taking cues from, from our, our, our Spirit of Prophecy Councils on this, which, which maybe he could be, and maybe we don't even know it. But William Struthers, in his book Wired for Intimacy, talks about even if you're not viewing actual pornography or any actual lustful images, he talks about masturbation as playing with neurochemical fire. It says, masturbation is playing with neurochemical fire. It affects one emotionally and neurologically. Now, isn't that an interesting statement from the very community that for many years has said, well, this is an appropriate and good thing to do, and children should begin engaging in this, and uh, what a lie from the devil, right? It's start, they're starting to come around in recent publications like Wired for Intimacy, and they're like, whoa, we've made kind of a mistake on this. It's like playing with neurochemical fire. You don't want to be going there within the brain because the, sexually, the sexual wiring within your brain that you establish from an early age is not just like a switch that you can just turn on and turn off. I mean, it starts to affect the way that you perceive and experience these things that you then take into adult life and into marriage, and it messes with things in a bad way. That's what he's getting at in that book. Now, here's an even better book on it. It's called A Solemn Appeal Relative to Solitary Vice. That's an euphemism for masturbation, solitary vice. A solemn appeal relative to solitary vice and the abuses and excesses of the marriage relation. They had really long titles back then sometimes. But um, that one was, uh, that, that was quite a mouthful there. But a lot of what this is is spirit of prophecy statements in this book, and frankly you find it in Child Guidance and in other places, where for many years Christians who read these books they'd come across these statements and they'd kind of be like, what did that say? I, I, I don't really see how engaging in solitary vice or self-abuse, as it's sometimes called in these pages, how that is going to cause these things. I mean, there's like a list of symptoms and things that will emerge in your life that are a result of practicing these behaviors. And for many years, people were puzzled by, how is this, how is this the case? I mean, let me just give you the bullet-pointed list. And for many, time, for many years, people have kind of run from this and ignored this and felt embarrassed by it. But the effects of what they called self-abuse 
are listed as being the following. And this wouldn't be every single person is going to have all of these, but this is some of the results of some of these occasions. Uh, pain in the shoulders, side, and back. Great exhaustion after exercising. A lack of strength or endurance. A deficiency in the mental strength. Absent-mindedness. Daydreaming and inattention. Forgetfulness and a weak memory. A weakened brain in general lack of perseverance, and a reluctance to engage in active labor, a gloomy sadness upon the countenance, frequent exhibitions of a morose temper in those who were once cheerful, kind, and affectionate, Dispose, being disposed to look upon the dark side, a loss of appetite, poor sleep, tired feelings in the morning, damage to the nervous system, being easily irritated, or what they would call nervousness, decay of the skull. Now, this sounds really crazy, I know, but watch this. This is going to get amazing. The lack of healthful beauty and a, a sallow face, the progress of disease upon them, cancerous tumors, inflamed mucous membranes, also known as the common cold, rheumatism, weakened eyesight, and dropsy, or edema. Now, this list, as shocking as it was and maybe still is to us, holds up to scrutiny of modern scientific research, believe it or not. I know it sounds crazy, and for many years people have been kind of ashamed of some of this, and they were like minimizing it, and we don't really want to talk about it. Or sometimes we would just frankly, many people in our midst would look at these and, and make fun of it, and they oh, they used to say this. And, well, you know, it's kind of not cool to, like, the kids, they were, go up, you bald head, to, um, to Elisha. Uh, when you have prophetic insight, you don't just take that and scoff at it, right? I mean, that's kind of a serious thing. So let's analyze it seriously and try to understand how and what these things mean. So what does the latest science say? Well, let's first take Cooper and Carnes' research from 2004 and 2001. They found that masturbating as little as two times per week has been shown in research to increase depression, memory problems, lack of focus, concentration problems, fatigue, back pain, and pelvic or testicular pain. Now, some of this might already be sounding familiar from that long list, but we're going to take these and piece them side by side, the others, in a minute. Let me, let me just zoom through all the research, and then we'll circle back around and show the research next to the Spirit of Prophecy statements uh, or bullet points. Um, let's talk about zinc. Zinc is a hugely important mineral, aiding in the formation of bone and the prevention of bone breakdown. Uh, it's helpful in immunity as the first line of defense in skin and mucous membranes, and it helps to activate immune cells. Zinc also is helpful for just normal growth of the body in general from childhood and youth. And zinc is important for fighting infections and healing wounds and even in combating disease because zinc is an important component of antioxidants. Zinc is also used for diaper rash. It's used to reduce ADHD. It's used to improve skin health. It's used in the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. It's used in the treatment for macular degeneration. It's used by the liver to help bind toxins for removal. Zinc is used for eye health. Zinc is used for skin health. Zinc is used to boost mood and to boost brain health. Now they say you need 10 milligrams of zinc per day. And also for men, one ejaculation can dispose of five milligrams of zinc per day. Or according to MD, PhD, David Horobin, the amount of zinc in semen is such that one ejaculation may get rid of all the zinc that can be absorbed from the intestines in one day. Repeated ejaculation may lead to a real zinc deficiency with various problems developing. Which also, by the way, begs the question, what about biblically sanctioned you know, sexual engagement? And this, you remember the title of the book was uh, A Solemn Appeal Relative to Solitary Vice and the excesses of the marriage relation. So there is such a thing even as, now it doesn't give us the exact amount. So, you know, people want, want give me, give me, give me the, the hard data there. And, you know, this is something we all have to pray through and seek the Lord on. But there is such a thing as excesses, even of the marital relation. Um, studies have linked zinc deficiency with worse, dim, worse vision in dim environment, poor immunity, White spots on the nails, which actually pornography users report as you look at their message boards and stuff uh, online. They, they talk about white spots on their nails disappearing as they have given up um, engaging in these behaviors. And dry skin and acne, also a result of zinc deficiency. 
Now, one more quote from the scientist, and then we'll bring this all together. Richard Nyes, PhD in clinical psychology, stated that masturbation breaks down the finer sensitivities of our nervous system. It is not difficult to see in terms of the electrical mediation of our nervous system how disease becomes a natural result of individuals who have placed their own gratification at the center of their being. Disease is the natural result of this. Pretty strong statement there. Now, let's go back to this list. And this list that sounded so crazy, even to us five minutes ago, but especially to people years ago when they didn't have all this updated research, let's take it uh, just piece by piece, section by section in this list, okay? The first one I've just highlighted in red. Do you remember these? Pain in the shoulder, side and back. Great exhaustion after exercising. A lack of strength or endurance. A deficiency in the mental strength, absent-mindedness, a daydreaming, inattention, forgetfulness, a weak memory, and a weakened brain. That list right there I have put in that order because there it is in <laughs> Cooper and Carnes' research. Memory problems, lack of focus, concentration problems, fatigue, back pain, pelvic or testicular pain. Exactly from the crazy statements from 130 years ago that they were making or 140 years ago. And I'm going, wow. I mean, we've been warned, haven't we? And the science is backing this up. Now, how about this section? Highlighted in blue. Lack of perseverance and a reluctance to engage in active labor. A gloomy sadness upon the countenance. Frequent exhibitions of a morose temper in those who were once cheerful, kind, and affectionate. Disposed to look upon the dark side. Loss of appetite. Poor sleep. Tired feelings in the morning. Now, do you know that all of these are actually one thing? Do you know what it is? All of these blue ones are symptoms of one disease, mental situation, and it's called depression. And Cooper and Carnes found that masturbating as little as times, two times per week has been shown to increase depression, which again, lack of perseverance to, and reluctance to engage in active labor, that's depression. So, gloomy sadness, depression. Morose temper, depression. Looking upon the dark side, loss of appetite, poor sleep, tired feelings in the morning. These are all symptoms of depression. Now let's look at these two green ones. I don't have any scientific papers, research statements on this, but what I do have is anecdotal evidence from the pornography recovery community. When you go and, and, and read what they're saying and what they're experiencing, they talk about how their, their tremors are disappearing. And like, tremors? I had no idea that they were experiencing tremors and these, this nervousness. They say their, their, their irritation and nervousness feelings that they often had are starting to disappear now that they're giving up these behaviors. Pretty interesting. How about this last section? These were the ones that sounded the craziest, I know. The purple ones, right? Decay of the skull lack of healthful beauty, the sallow face, the progress of disease upon them, cancerous tumors, inflamed mucous membranes, so the common cold, rheumatism, weakened eyesight, and dropsy, or in other words, edema. Now, each of these is related to zinc and zinc deficiency. Let's take a look at each one. Decay of the skull, as crazy as that sounds, for the proper bone formation and the prevention of bone breakdown, if you don't have enough zinc, you could actually have struggles with your, with your bones, your bones weakening. And in this case, referring to the skull bone. Now, zinc, of course, you, you may be zinc deficient as men engage in these behaviors as we studied. So if you're zinc deficient, then all of a sudden you have less bone quality and, and, and growth. How about this one? The lack of healthful beauty in a sallow face. Well, remember that zinc deficiency causes dry skin acne, and, and zinc is used to improve skin health, and it's used in the treatment of diaper rash, so zinc is important in the skin. So you see sallow you know, face and lack of healthful beauty, another result of zinc deficiency. How about this one? This one was, again, harder to believe. The prog progress of disease upon people and cancerous tumors? Well, remember that zinc aids in immunity and in fighting infections and in healing wounds. And zinc aids in combating disease because it's a component of antioxidants. And remember what Dr. Richard Nye says, disease is the natural result of this. Now, that doesn't mean every person, right? But it's going to increase the chances, increases the risk factors just a bit. Inflamed mucous membranes or the common cold. Well, this is an easy one. Zinc is essential in immunity as the first line of defense in skin and mucous membranes. And zinc helps activate, activate immune cells and it fights infections and it's used by the liver to help bind toxins for removal. So we're more likely to get sick if we don't have zinc. And many people take zinc when they have a cold or whatever. Rheumatism. Well, zinc is used in the treatment for rheumatoid arthritis. A weakened eyesight. 
Zinc is used in the treatment of macular degeneration, and zinc deficiency causes worse vision in a dim environment. So that crazy stuff about it's going to make you go blind and all the people used to laugh at it, well, actually, it does affect the vision. It's particularly in a, in, a, in a dim environment, sufficient zinc is important for eye quality. It's very, very important. And so it's, the spirit of prophecy has been vindicated again. Dropsy, uh, it, which is edema, is also treated with zinc and other nutrients. And so there we have it. I mean, can you say that you can, be, you can be proud to stand upon those who've come before us? Even they sounded crazy in their day and what they said and, and wrote. And well, this has come from the Lord to us as, as warnings, as direction, as counsel, as advice, as helpful encouragement to follow the ways of the Lord and find health and joy and happiness in life and not depression and all of these negative things. Now, uh, this is why the Bible says, uh, one of the reasons why the Bible says, Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. That word abstain is kind of hard for our culture because we like to make compromises. We like to say everything in moderation. Really? Everything in moderation? Like immoral and unhealthful things in moderation? No, not everything in moderation. Healthy things in moderation. Abstinence from those things which are harmful. And on, on and our health, our mental health, our spiritual health, we want to abstain from fle fleshly lusts which war against the soul. The Bible was very clear when it said abstain. Now you might say, well, the Bible doesn't seem to take this issue on in any specific or you know, really, really uh, in your face sort of straightforward manner. It uses words like abstain from fleshly lusts. But there is one psalm that I was reading and studying one morning for personal devotions. And as I was reading verse by verse, it was also at the time that I was studying for this seminar and preparing these slides and coming up with this information to put that together. And I was like, whoa, this seems to be describing the very topic we are talking about right now. Take a look at this. It's Psalm 38. And it says, uh, not overtly, but step by step, you might notice a picture coming together here. Verse 2, the psalmist feels that the hand of God is pressing him down and the arrows of God are piercing him. He feels this sense of guilt and shame and condemnation from God. This is kind of what we talked about earlier, isn't it? That many people, many sinners in any type of sin find themselves in and they just feel this, this, this chronic shame and this feeling of condemnation of a distant dictatorial God. That's the feeling of the psalmist as he begins. And then he says this, There is no soundness in my flesh, nor any health in my bones because of my sin. Okay, well, that could be a coincidence. He's talking about his flesh. He's talking about his bones. We just studied about the bones. We just studied about the flesh. But let's see if there's more verses that tend to bring a picture together here. Then he says, I am troubled. I am bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. What do you call that in modern mental health circles? We call that depression, right? I mean, he's bowed down greatly. He goes mourning all the day long. He's depressed. Then his loins, which the, the Hebrew word can be translated here as the side or, or the, 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 it says some, some translations say searing pain or burning. Loins are full with inflammation. The pelvic area, the side, the back, that's what they would say as, as the Hebrew term there. For loins. Now, again, does that sound familiar from some things we were just studying? Pain in the, in the side, back, and the searing, burning, as the other translations would call that. Hmm. Verse 8, I am feeble and severely broken. I groan because of the turmoil of my heart. You see, he's got a, a woundedness, a brokenness uh, from in, within him. And, and I'm thinking about those people who grew up in those homes where they were maybe emotionally disengaged or maybe even abuse situations or neglect situations. And there's an in, inner turmoil, a brokenness. And he talks about that. He says, I am feeble and severely broken and I have turmoil in my heart. So he has, a, he has some wounds there in his, in his deep inner being. And in verse 10, he says, my heart pants. Remember we talked about the prefrontal cortex and the 100 beats per minute. My strength fails me. Didn't we just talk about people who are, 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 have no strength for exercise and exertions and, and labor, and they have no strength? Then he says, as for the light of my eyes, it has also gone from me. This is all in one psalm. Maybe this is a coincidence, but this is really starting to encourage the person struggling with this, where they're like, maybe this psalm is speaking into my existence. I mean, this is, these are all the symptoms right there. And he goes on and says, my loved ones and friends stand aloof from my plague. So he's got this, this isolation concept in his life where he's all alone and no true intimacy. And 
struggling with this in the darkness and isolation of just loneliness. Verse 12, those who also seek my life, that would be the devil in our uh, spiritual analogy here, lay snares for me and plan deception all the day long. You see, the devil's got that going on with people's habits and addictions. He's going to bring up a little trigger, a little alert, a little thing to intercept your day that he knows is just a typical way to get you down that road of, 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 of habitual sin. He's planning those traps. He's planning those snares. That's exactly what's happening in the psalm, too. I am like a mute who does not open his mouth. So this is something that it's just in the, in the, in the loneliness and isolation of his own self, that there's no, there's no openness and, 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 and vulnerability in crying out to God and seeking the counsel of others, like, like in this seminar, who might give us some, some advice and some suggestions. It's just I'm, I'm a mute. I don't talk about it, think about it. I just ruminate over it. I just feel in this state of sin. Thus, I am like a man who does not hear. He doesn't hear the answer from God. But then he gets a glimmer of hope. In you, O Lord, I hope. You will hear, O Lord, my God. But then he says, for I'm ready to fall. It's like, ah, it was hope. And then, oh, he's just gone down this path so many times. He just figures it'll happen again. There's no true confidence in victory. It's just, I'm ready to fall. My sorrow is continually before me. So the depression and the cycle and the downward spiral continues. Now, let's sum up what we've seen so far. What does this sound like? He feels condemnation and shame. He has skin abnormalities. He has an unhealthy body and bones. He has depression. He has loins or back or side pain. He has a wounded heart and emotional pain. He has an increased heart rate and he has fatigue. He has weakened vision. He has isolation with the devil setting snares all around to entrap him. He keeps it secret, doesn't hear a solution from God, but then gets a glimmer of hope in God, followed by falling and a sorrowful future. This kind of sounds like the thing we're talking about now, but then things change for him. He says, I will declare my iniquity. I will be in anguish over my sin. My enemies are vigorous and they are strong. So that's important. We've got to recognize the seriousness of this. We declare our iniquity. We go to God in complete confession and repentance. We go in complete just openness to God and knowing his love for us, but knowing the danger and strength of the enemy. You go and say, my enemies are vigorous and strong, but do not forsake me, O Lord, my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. That would be a good verse to memorize, wouldn't it? In that situation of temptation, in that habitual moment of, of lust or appetite or whatever it is that's drawing us down that path into the abyss, say this, because this is the victory call and song of the redeemed. Do not forsake me, O Lord, my God. Be not far from me. Make haste to help me, O Lord, my salvation. That's the spiritual principle behind it all. How about the practical neurological aspects of this. You learned about the lust cascade and the LGN and the occipital lobe and the, the, the norepinephrine and all of that. Like it was kind of, you know, terminology overload. So let's just bring this down to how do we gain victory over that neurological process called the lust cascade? Well, the first tip, practical piece of advice, and by the way, I have three hours on the series that we have. It's a six DVD series called A Greater Lust, a biblical word for lust meaning a desire. A, it could be a holy desire or an unholy desire. Jesus used that Greek word when he said, I desire to eat the Passover with my disciples. So we want a higher and holier desire for the things of God, for true holy intimacies in our lives, and for most of all, our relationship with our Creator. And so that series, the last three discs, are all about the victory plan. It's all about the practical steps you can take, okay? And we've touched on just a little bit of those so far. I wanna end with some of those as we, as we cruise toward the end right now. But the first one is, you need to be able to calm down. You need to be able to calm the heart rate, calm the amygdala. And one of the best ways you can do that is by a deep breath, deep breathing. I'm not talking about new edge meditation here. I'm just talking about correct, proper breathing. The Spirit of Prophecy says that a good respiration soothes the nerves. Isn't that amazing? Because what they found in research is if you take a deep breath, the, there's a nerve right here that links up into the limbic system of the brain where you have all the amygdala and the agitation and the lust feelings and everything like that. All the emotions and anxieties of life all happen there in the, in the limbic system. When you take a deep breath, the dorsal vagal nerve, which links up there into the limbic system, is calmed. That's been proven in modern research. They said over 100 years ago, a good respiration soothes the nerves. Also, it fills the brain with enough oxygen, the blood with enough oxygen so that the prefrontal cortex can function better. 
and you can calm. And I'm not talking about like, um, like this, but although if you do take nine deep breaths in prayer, filling your minds with the principles of God, never emptying your minds, but nine deep breaths actually change the biochemical state of your body and your brain, which is kind of neat, right? I mean, you just calm down, you know? We're so fast-paced, we take such shallow breaths, and we're so anxious and, 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 and fast, it just uh, stressed all the time, kind of like that sentence was, right? It didn't come out. It just didn't seem to come out, because that's how we feel in this modern age, and we just struggle, right? To slow down, God says, be still and know that I am God. Right? There's a still small voice waiting to encourage us. And we take that deep breath. We start the process of being able to alter our thoughts. But before we talk about altering our thoughts, physical health is hugely important when it comes to overcoming the lust of the flesh. When we're talking about the gut-brain connection. I mean, so much of what we struggle with in our brain is because our gut is unhealthy, and that's all, you know, there's, there's a connection there between the neurons of the brain and the, the, the nerves and cells within the gut, okay? And when we have that, that agitation and that negativity happening, the brain can't function properly, and we enter into all sorts of mental disorders, dis, you know, deceptions, lusts, depression, anxiety, and all of that. And so that, a lot of that can be helped with a good, healthy, nutritious diet where the gut starts to get back in order and its proper balance of proper good bacteria, and then it communicates positive, positive um, assistance to the brain. Sleep. Getting enough sleep is huge. People who are lacking sleep are much more inclined to be making poor choices for diet, for lust, for everything, because the brain just isn't kicking on all cylinders because you you're, you're uh, sleep deprived. Exercise, super, super important. I mean, when we're sedentary, the brain just, just is not able to gain these kinds of victories over habits. Now, we could go on and on and on and on and on and on and on with this one. In fact, I've got a whole session. I'll, I'll just give you that hint. And I get a, it's, it's, it's like uh, full disclosure here. You're going to hear a whole session on living out the health message. It's most of a whole session on living out the health message as a component in our plan for victory over habits. And that, my friends, is so important that I'm just not even going to try to um, sufficiently touch on it here because it needs to be really delved into in depth. And so I'll leave that to that, that hour on, on disc uh, number five of the, of the lust series. Now, how to stop the lust cascade from happening mentally, neurologically, visually? Well, let's, let's say, okay, hypothetically that image pops up, right? You see something on the screen, on, on the magazine or whatever, and you're drawn to that, right? Hypothalamus says that is good, right? LGN says, I just saw it, and the occipital lobe goes, let me see it some more. The amygdala is saying, let me see it some more. Okay, well, that millisecond where you have a momentary choice to encourage that thought, and go back for that second look or hold that image, that millisecond is huge. This is where the battle is waged. Because once you go down the, the highway with high containment walls and very few exits, it's a lot more difficult, right? The prefrontal cortex is out and the, the, you're in just that survival reactive mode. So what you want to do is at that moment, take that deep breath and immediately change the thought. Change the thought. Uh, because the, the visual cortex is seeing that and wanting to see that more. Change the thought into something visual something else that, that, that you consider and that the mind sees or, or, or thinks about. And if you, if you just try not to think about it, have you ever tried that? Just, just don't think about it, just don't think about it. Just let me do a little test on you, okay? Nobody in this room right now think about an elephant. Everybody just thought about an elephant, didn't they? It doesn't work very well to just say, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think about it, I'm not going to think about it. Well, you end up thinking about it because you're thinking about the thing you're not going to think about. So there's something wonderful. Jesus said if a demon is cast out of a man and he just sweeps the house and puts it in order, he doesn't fill it with anything new, that demon goes out and gets seven more, more wicked than himself, and they come in and occupy that house. So here's the thing. If the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted to one thought pattern, the, power, the brain is powerful enough to get you addicted, so to speak, to a new thought pattern, a new habit of the mind. So don't think about addiction recovery as stopping something. Think about addiction recovery as becoming obsessively focused on something else that replaces the something that you're not even thinking about anymore, right? So, so you have a habit of mind where that image shows up and you have a go-to thing that you do, that you think, that you say, that you sing, whatever. And, and I want to use the analogy of a trampoline, okay? It's kind of like these situations will arise, even at church, right? I mean, there, there, there are things that are, that are immodest in our world unfortunately. But you're, it's like you're being bounced onto a trampoline and you get a choice onto where you're going to bounce. You're going to bounce, but where will you bounce is the question. There's an abyss, a cliff right here, and the devil's throwing you down at that trampoline at this angle and naturally you'll go Whoa! and go hurtling into the cliff to destruction. But if we put a little muscle into this thing, and by the way, it does take a little bit more electrochemical energy to reroute 
uh, neurological pathway around the habitual normal path because that's natural and normal and it's become habitual and easy for us. So it takes a little more energy. That's why we need that oxygen, exercise, water, fresh air, sleep. We need to be in good health so we can use that energy. But, but what we're doing is we're putting a little muscle into this bounce and we can actually use the devil's own temptation against him. And what I mean by that is, you can, you can use this as an opportunity to be drawn closer to your Savior. Because in the process of gaining victory over sin, we are experiencing the living God in our lives, right? So the devil thinks he's going to take us down through this, when really, the temptation is just the opportunity. See, you see, the Bible says God will not let us be tempted beyond what we can bear. Does it say the Bible won't let us be tempted? I mean, does it say God won't let us be tempted? No, it says that God won't be, let us be tempted beyond what we can bear, but he will provide a way out so that we can stand up under it. And that is, is better almost than if we had never even encountered the battle to begin with, because now we can say we've gained victory. We've got, we've got some badges here of, of strength and honor and valor that the Lord has granted to us. It's not in our own strength, but he says, well done, good and faithful servant. And you, you, you feel like you can fight another day when you're gaining these victories because you're, you're, you're putting a little strength into that and you're bouncing heavenward instead of bouncing over the cliff. And what would that bounce mean specifically? Well, it could be a couple of different things. That, that image shows up and you know what the normal human response is? Ooh, I like that Twinkie, right? I want to behold that. I want to... I want to, you know, contemplate that. But instead of doing that, you say, you know what? This is a human being who, who has value, who has identity, who is an image bearer of God, who has a, a past and a background. I mean, maybe it's a pornographic thing out there. You know, the misery that most of these people are living in, right? And, and the background that they have of abuse, many of them, and drug abuse. And you start thinking those thoughts, all of a sudden it's not so much selfish pleasure for me. Or you think, you know, how would I feel if my mother or sister ended up in this kind of situation? Well, that's somebody's mother or sister right there. So when you start thinking altruistic thoughts, it really replaces, it, it can't coincide with thoughts of selfish hedonism, right? It's like the, the, the teeter-totter, right? And so you're thinking of that person's benefit. And, 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 and that's a dangerous thing. You don't want to so much be thinking of that person so much. If, if, in many cases, it's better just to, just to flee into the heavenly sanctuary in, just in, 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 your, in your thinking. Because when you think about a visual scene of Jesus Christ, the high priest of heaven, blotting out sins and ministering on our behalf. I mean, that is the most reverent and holy scene imaginable, right? And when we are rerouting from this normal pathway here to that, it's like we, the devil's throwing us into this briar patch, but here we are bouncing into something, just contemplating the, the vast immensity of the plan of redemption that we are experiencing right now. Or maybe it's a Bible verse that you have memorized. That's your go-to thing. And so when that, when that thing shows up, and maybe this isn't even a lust thing. Maybe you're listening to this and you're like, boy, everything I'm hearing is speaking right to my chocolate addiction or whatever it might be. And like, I didn't know he was going to talk about chocolate. I didn't intend to, but maybe that's the thing. When, when that shows up, you have that Bible verse or whatever the habit is. You have that hymn. You have that scripture song that comes in. And I like to advise especially um, visual Verses like, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And you, 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 that, that puts an image in your mind. So the occipital lobe has some activity, right? Instead of the activity of this, the, 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 the occipital lobe is, is envisioning, imagining, seeing things, right? The lamp, and I'm not talking about like weird new age stuff, like, you know, that kind of thing. But the Bible puts, puts images and, you know, Jesus tells object lessons and you think about the sheep and you think about the sower and the seed and there's nothing inherently wrong about, about knowing what those things look like when you're hearing and thinking of those verses. And that's a, that's a really good thing. But, you know, when it comes to the, the altruistic thoughts of, of that person's background and their, their life, you know, have you ever noticed that we, we call them users of pornography and we call them consumers of pornography and we call it pornographic material? I mean, how degrading is that, right? These human beings are referred to as material. And the users of them are using them, which is an appropriate term, consuming them. I mean, this is not fast food, right? I mean, this is not the consumer culture. This is human beings who have that value. So we want to make sure to enhance those circuits of actual love and not this degraded, fake, counterfeit intimacy. You know, sometimes you just say, no, thank you. You know, Satan offers you something, no, thank you, and you move on and think of the Lord Jesus. I mean, there are many, many, many things we can replace our habitual thoughts with, but remember this principle. Recovering from a habit of mind is not so much the process of stopping something as it is the process of discovering some compulsive new thought pattern, a new addiction, if you will, uh, to something good and holy. And so when you focus on that aspect, instead of saying, I'm not going to think about an elephant, then all of a sudden it starts to become a lot easier than, oh, I just want to, I just want I just got to battle this thing and I'm battling this thing. And some people enter into like, you know, addiction recovery in a way where they're just talking about their addiction all the time. And that's, that becomes 
becomes the focus and the substance of conversation constantly. And I'm going, you know, I, I, I want to be talking about Jesus and getting my minds on other things, mind on other things. And, and, and Jesus wants to separate that sin from us as far as the East is from the West. A lot of addicts walk around saying, I am an alcoholic. Even though they've had victory for a year, for five years, for ten years. Hi, I'm so-and-so, and I am an alcoholic. And, you know, I don't mean to take anything away from those who've been benefited from, you know, the, the organization that promotes that approach. And, and there's a lot of wonderful people. A good friend of mine swears by it, and he's, he's, he's uh, dry and clean and off of alcohol to this day. So I know it's helped a lot of people. But theologically, we can do even better. And that is, when I am in Christ, I am a new creation. The old has gone, the new has come. I have the mind of Christ. He wants to take away our stony heart and give us a heart of flesh. Circumcise the flesh. It is the new man, the mind of Christ. I mean, how many analogies in the Bible are there of complete and total victory over sin? No longer I am an alcoholic. Did you see that t-shirt that was really popular for a while that Christians wore? And it would just say sinner on it with period. Sinner, period. Like, that's my identity. Like, yeah, I get we're all born in sin and, you know, we're all struggling. We're, we're all, you know, facing sin in our lives that we want victory over. But that's not our main identity, right? Our main identity is a new creation. And that is wonderful. The mystery of, or the, the, uh, the, the hope of glory, Christ in me. The hope of glory. Listen to this statement. If Satan seeks to turn the mind to low and sensual things, bring it back. When corrupt imaginings seek to gain possession of your mind, flee to the throne of grace and pray for strength from heaven. By the grace of Christ, it is possible for us to reject impure thoughts. Jesus will attract the mind, purify the thoughts, and cleanse the heart from every secret sin. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. That's the ultimate goal here. Literally, the old brain pathways and brain map of all the different circuits and activity and roads in our mental and behavioral experience, that old brain is being replaced by a new brain day by day as we chart new pathways and allow those old ones to just shrivel up and die away. And over time, we can have a renewed brain. Romans 12, verse 2. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Listen to this one from William Struthers, author of Wired for Intimacy. He says, if this corrupted pathway can be avoided, a new pathway can be formed. That's the key. We can establish a healthy sexual pattern where the flow is redirected toward holiness rather than corrupted intimacy. So it's like the trampoline analogy, right? The, the, the sexual encounter happens, but instead of going into corrupted intimacy, you allow that bounce to go, oh yeah, the sexual nature thing reminds me of the great controversy and God's nature and how he created marriage. And all of a sudden you're thinking theologically and you're thinking about your relationship with Christ in a holy manner, right? And so it's redirected and, and, and you do sort of like a judo move on the devil, if you will. I'm not into martial arts, but you understand the concept of taking the enemy's momentum against him and destroying him with his own efforts. That's what the devil's going to have done to him by many a men gaining victory over this. And it's kind of exciting to think about it. And the Bible says that God will destroy and crush the head of the serpent under our feet shortly in Romans 16. Under our feet. We get the privilege. By intentionally redirecting the neurochemical flow, the path toward right thinking becomes the preferred path and is established as the mental habit. By deepening the holiness pathways, we are freed from deciding to do what is right and good as they become part of our embodied nature. Have you ever heard the statement in the wonderful book, Desire of Ages, and it says, you know, the closer we get to God's plan for our lives, it says something like, in doing God's will, we will be but carrying out our own impulses. That's called being addicted to purity in a pornographic world. That's a compulsive fixation on that which is right and true and holy and beautiful. That is a habitual love of God and dedication to that which is His will for us. Imagine if you could be neurologically enslaved to purity rather than porn, says William Struthers. Enslaved to seeing the dignity of each individual rather than, rather than their utility to you. The process of sanctification is an addiction to holiness a compulsive fixation on Christ and an impulsive pattern of compassion, virtue, and love. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one's slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness? You know, we're going to be enslaved either to sin or, the, or to compulsive righteousness as led by the Spirit of God. 
I want to be addicted to holiness. Do you? Let's listen to this closing quotation from the story. This, is, this quotation is four slides long. We're going to end with this. It is awesome, so I'm going to quote the whole thing. You know the story of the man at the pool of Bethesda. And Jesus was there, and he said, Do you want to be made well? And the man was laying there, and he felt like he could do nothing. He was completely impotent, completely paralyzed. And it says, by sin, this is from Ministry of Healing, by sin we have been severed from the life of God. Our souls are palsied. Of ourselves, we are no more capable of living a holy life than was the impotent man capable of walking. Many realize their helplessness. They are longing for that spiritual life which will bring them into harmony with God and are striving to obtain it, but in vain. In despair, they cry, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Let those desponding, struggling ones look the Savior is bending over the purchase of His blood, saying with inexpressible tenderness and pity, Wilt thou be made whole? He bids you arise in health and peace. Do not wait to feel that you are made whole. Believe the Savior's word. Put your will on the side of Christ. Will to serve Him and in acting upon His word, you will receive strength. Whatever may be the evil practice, the master passion, which through long indulgence binds both soul and body, Christ is able and longs to deliver. He will impart life to the soul that is dead in trespasses. He will set free the captive that is held by weakness and misfortune and the chains of sin. The sense of sin has poisoned the springs of life, but Christ says, I will take your sins. I will give you peace. I have bought you with my blood. You are mine. My grace shall strengthen your weakened will. Your remorse for sin I will remove. When temptations assail you, when care and perplexity surround you, when depressed and discouraged, you are ready to yield to despair. Look to Jesus, and the darkness that encompasses you will be dispelled by the bright shining of his presence. When sin struggles for the mastery in your soul, and burdens the conscience. Look to the Savior. His grace is sufficient to subdue sin. Let your grateful heart, trembling with uncertainty, turn to Him. Lay hold on the hope set before you. Christ waits to adopt you into His family. His strength will help your weakness. He will lead you step by step. Place your hand in His and let Him guide you. Never feel that Christ is far away. He is always near. His loving presence surrounds you. Seek Him as one who desires to be found of you. He desires you not only to touch His garments, but to walk with Him in constant communion. Constant communion with Jesus. To walk with God as Enoch did. That's the ultimate solution to all of our habits of sin. To have constant communion with the living God. To trust in Him for his merits, for his forgiveness, for the victory over sin that he wrought out in his life of perfect living. He gives that and offers that to us so that our title to heaven, our forgiveness, and our fitness for heaven, victory over sin, is given to us by the righteousness of Christ. Do you want to claim that today? Do you want to experience his communion with you moment by moment every day? Because he loves you and he forgives you right now. This moment where you repent and you say, this is it. And I know there's been other repentances. And I'm not going to be discouraged by the fact that they didn't pan out. This time, right now, I will do whatever you ask, Lord. And if there is a time where a righteous man falls seven times, the Bible says he gets back up. And I'm never going to give up walking with you until we walk into heaven and are translated like Enoch did. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the precious love of Jesus, for the friendship, for the relational connection that we can have with the divine. And we do ask now for a true sense of full and complete forgiveness that we can receive from you right now as we confess we are sinners. We have fallen short of your glory. There is no man who is righteous, no, not even one. And we all know the struggles we've had in the past. But right now, as we bring those before you and surrender self completely and our own pleasures and our habits and the way we've done things in the past, as we repent completely from that way of life, we know that that's only the repentance that you grant unto us. 
and that you grant to each of us a measure of faith. We can't even uh, manufacture and drum up within ourselves enough faith and repentance. We, there's nothing we can offer to please you. We, we bring nothing but open hands to receive of the grace that you want to minister unto us. And we thank you for that promise. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that we can claim righteousness right now, the robe of the righteousness of Christ. What, an, what unworthy, wicked people we have been, but we know that you say that the old has gone and the new has come and that rivers appear in the deserts and flowers bloom in the desert and that, behold, you will do a new thing, saith the Lord. We claim that promise and we ask you to give us a new life. Give us whole new activities and ways to avoid the lusts and the, the, the worldly things that have captured us. We pray that you'd help us to commit to just radically different changes in our lives to, to bring about ways that we will be with you and less with the things of this world, that we will have that victory plan and a step-by-step and -step program and plan to focus on you so that day by day we can become more and more like Jesus in preparation for his soon coming. Just like Enoch, may we walk with you and know you are always with us, always near. Thank you for your love and forgiveness and give us the power over the enemy, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thanks for tuning in to this seminar video. I can say confidently that God is changing many, many lives through the information that you've seen in this video. We hear it from folks all the time in the feedback we get. And we operate on a shoestring budget. Literally, it's by God's grace through folks like yourself ordering the full DVD seminars. Go to beltoftruthministries.org. This is what funds us and enables us to share more material like this. You'll see there the Greater Lust full six DVD set. We've got a whole host of other topics there at beltoftruthministries.org from the media and entertainment to the parenting to true education and the lust topic. I want to thank you in advance for ordering DVDs, for sharing them. That's what it's all about is changing lives. So may the Lord richly bless your family with more of his spirit and more of Jesus. Thanks for watching.